Hello everyone, this is Cliff Reed, and I'm talking about optimizing the aspects of a mission that are not the clinical side, but the non-clinical factors. And the way we're going to do that is to cover the elements of the zero point survey. We all know that when we start resuscitating a patient, we assess and manage them using an ABCDE approach, the primary survey. But that's not our first opportunity to get that mission to go smoothly. The zero point on the clock where we can get the non-clinical factors in line could be on arrival on scene or en route to scene or when we turn up on station in the morning or even the night before when we get ourselves ready for the early shift the next day. These opportunities to get ourselves and our team and our environment sorted before we meet the patient can be summarized as the zero point survey before the primary survey. So the idea is we optimize ourselves, our teams, our environment, and then we assess and manage the patient with the primary survey. Once the resuscitation is ongoing, we then regularly share a mental model by announcing an update in the patient status and what the priorities or plans are from that point. If the patient deteriorates, we go back and repeat the primary survey. If the scene or mission is deteriorating, we go back and repeat the zero point survey. So let's break down these components, starting with self. When we want to optimize our performance, we need to think about physical and psychological preparedness. With physical preparedness, we can use the I'm safe acronym to ensure that we're physically optimized for performance on that day. With the psychological preparedness, I like to think about three components or three ways in which our brains interact with the demands of the scene. There's the emotional or stress side of things, the cognitive aspects, and the perceptual aspects, by which I mean with stress, we can think about how we do a threat challenge appraisal, and if we have a physiological stress response, how to employ the psychological tools to calm ourselves down and get back into the zone. By the cognitive aspects, I mean our mental bandwidth and how we manage to preserve our functioning and not become overloaded. And by the perceptual demands, I'm really talking about situational awareness, how we become, how we avoid becoming task focused. So let's begin with how to control the stress response. When we are required to do a difficult task, our brains will perform a subconscious calculation. They will assess what the demands of the task are and whether we have the resources to deal with it. If the demands outstrip our resources, it will be perceived as a threat and we will feel a stress response. It might be anxiety, it might be panic, it might be difficulty in concentrating. If we feel our resources are sufficient for the task, then we perceive that as a challenge, that's a good thing, bring it on, let's go, uh, we, can, we can manage it. So what we need to do if we are feeling ourselves becoming anxious or tachycardic or overwhelmed, is to employ psychological tools that will reappraise a threat as a challenge. And the way we do that is with Mike Laurier's Breathe Talk C. And there's also the focus component too, which I'm just going to talk about Breathe Talk C. Breathe Talk C is a way of reappraising a threat as a challenge by slowing down your breathing, which of course is the only part of your autonomic nervous system you can take conscious control over, and that will bring down your tachycardia and your feeling of overwhelmedness or panic. Talk refers to positive self-talk, which you do in your head. I've got this. We're a good team. I've got a good partner. We are trained for this. We have the resources. And C refers to visualization, seeing in your mind's eye the successful completion of a task or procedure. This is particularly good for practical procedures, like, for example, intubation. So if we can use the Breathe Talk C, beat the stress, BTS, to reappraise the threat as a challenge, it will bring down our stress response and we'll become in the performance zone. And rather than feeling overwhelmed on scene, we won't even be whelmed. We'll be in the zone and functioning well as a team and as individuals. So that's managing the stress response. The next thing is how do we manage the cognitive demands? We know that our psychological or cognitive bandwidth can become overloaded the more tasks we take on, the more those individual tasks deteriorate. And the way to preserve bandwidth is to automate tasks. Just like when we can have a conversation while driving now, which we couldn't do when we were learning to drive, 
We can automate other processes. We can do this using cognitive aids and cognitive forcing strategies and training and simulation. So for example, using a checklist for anesthesia is not done because we keep forgetting how to do an RSI. It's done to cognitively offload our teams so we have the bandwidth to do other things at the same time. Using emergency reference cards for pediatric drug doses and equipment sizes is a cognitive offloading tool. And being very familiar with our clinical practice standards or standard operating procedures or protocols preserves bandwidth. Simulation training and familiarity with equipment and processes preserves bandwidth. The next thing to think about is the perceptual side of psychological preparedness, which is our situational awareness. If we're task focused, like this doctor trying to operate a defibrillator, we're not going to see what's going on around us. But sometimes we do have to focus on a task. In this intubation, we want the people at the head end absolutely focused on getting the tube in the airway as swiftly as possible. But that requires a hands-off team leader who maintains the overview, the, who's optimized for situational awareness of the scene. If we think about this in evolutionary terms, we have predators and prey. Prey is something like a gazelle, evolved to have 360 degrees of vision, absolute situational awareness, is hypervigilant to any threats. It hears the crack of a twig, it thinks, goodness me, that's a cheetah. It hears the rush of wind in some trees, it thinks, oh no, it's a lion. It's constantly on the lookout for predators. As prey, then, it's hypervigilant, very sensitive, but not very specific. It picks up a lot of stuff, but not everything it picks up is relevant. The cheetah, on the other hand, is predator. It sees the gazelle, it sprints, it eats it, it feeds its cubs with it. It's task-focused on getting that gazelle. That's extremely efficient and highly specific, but not very sensitive. And that as it's sprinting, it may not notice the poacher in the Land Rover pointing his gun at her. And as humans, we may need to flit between predator and prey mode, between gazelle and cheetah mode. Here, during a pre-hospital RSI, the physician is being prey. She's being the gazelle. She has the overview. She's looking at the monitor. She's double-checking her drug dose. She's ensuring the drug is being infused without tissueing. The drip is still running, and so on. The paramedic is at the head end. He's going to be task-focused on optimizing oxygenation of that patient and a swift, slick tracheal intubation on first pass success. After the tube's in, they may swap roles. The doctor then may take over the ventilation of the patient and become task focused on optimizing the end tidal CO2. While the paramedic is now managing the scene, sorting out the logistics, communicating with the aircraft, guiding the rest of the team on clearing up equipment and so on. So we may have to hand off the roles of team leader and proceduralist of gazelle and cheetah using closed loop communication. I'm now going to write some notes. My eyes are off the patient. Roger, my eyes are on the patient. Hey doc, I now have to radio the hospital, let them know we're on our way. My eyes are off the patient. Roger, my eyes are on the patient. So closed loop communication can hand off this situational awareness. So we've spoken about self-preparedness as part of the zero point survey with the emotional or stress response, the cognitive bandwidth aspects, and the situational awareness aspects. Let's talk now about team optimization. Teamwork is often the biggest challenge in any resuscitation. You have a bunch of individuals, all of whom mean well and are good at their individual roles, but sometimes when it comes together, it can feel chaotic. What do we need for an effective team? We need a team leader. As well as a designated team leader, we need team members. And more important than who is team leader is that the team leader and team members work together towards a common goal. That's what a team does. And the best way to do that is to share a mental model. Mental models of what needs to be done, task work mental models, and mental models of who's going to do those tasks. Those are teamwork mental models. And the way we share those task work and teamwork mental models is by regular sharing of an update of patient status and the priorities about what we would like to do next and who's going to do it. So we do our zero point survey to prepare ourselves. We begin resuscitation and then we regularly update the team. 
This update and plan, update and priorities, can be done, of course, before you meet the patient as part of a pre-brief when you're given your tasking information. Or if you're in, a, in an emergency department trauma team, when you receive a call from the ambulance service that they're bringing in a patient, that's when you can share your mental model about what we know, what might happen, what we might have to do, and who's going to do it. So that up part of the zero point survey can take place before meeting the patient as part of a pre-brief. In our pre-hospital -pre service, we have a mapped out workflow between critical care paramedic and pre-hospital and retrieval medicine physician. And we arrive on scene together. We do our zero point survey. When we meet the patient, we split roles. And when the doctor has performed the clinical assessment and the paramedic has performed the logistic assessment, we come back together and share our findings and agree the clinical and logistic plan. That's the update and priorities of the zero point survey. So for the team part of the zero point survey, the T in step, we've got a leader, we've got members, we've allocated tasks and roles, we've updated the status of the patient or what we know and what the plan is going to be. But sometimes we can still have difficulties on being on the same page. Sometimes there are disagreements between clinicians and we have to be tactical about how we resolve that. There are a number of components to effective communication and even persuasion that are worth studying and training in and which we do train in in our induction simulations and testing. But the essence of it, to be good at persuasion, is essentially to be a good person, to be uh, cordial and professional and polite while being assertive. There are more sophisticated techniques, some of which overlap with hypnosis. And if things are still failing, then graded assertiveness tactics are very useful. There are many systems in place. My own personal favorite is the CUS system because it's so easy to remember. Informing the person whose plan you're disagreeing with that you are concerned about the patient's status uh, gives them something that they can't argue with. The same way if someone asks you how you are and you say, I've got a headache, they're not going to say, no, you haven't, because you own that headache. People can't argue that you're concerned. All they can do is have a look at what you're concerned about, consider that, and then if they want, still argue about that. But then you can escalate, I'm uncomfortable moving this patient in the current state, we need to secure their airway. No, no, come on, let's move them. I'm sorry, this is a safety issue. We're going to establish a definitive airway before we move this patient. Come on, I'll help you move the patient. You don't need to intubate them here. Stop. No one's moving this patient until we've secured this airway. I would appreciate your help with that. So CUS can actually have an extra S, which is the stop. The idea with graded assertiveness is you move up from concerned to uncomfortable to safety and stop if you have time. But there may be circumstances where you have to zoom in at stop as soon as you arrive on scene. If, for example, you think someone is about to make a critical drug error, you might say, hi there, I'm, oh, stop a sec, let's see what you've got there. I see you're about to eject adrenaline. You probably thought that was a saline flush, mate. Why don't we just uh, take a few seconds uh, to double check that and I'll, I'll help you draw up the flush. So that's graded assertiveness as a way of overcoming disagreements, particularly when confronting authority gradients. But as I previously said, there's a whole lot more to effective team communication, which is beyond the scope of this 25 minute talk. So that's self, team, and the next thing is environment. The most fascinating thing about environment is that to me, this is what defines the difference between pre-hospital and retrieval medicine and other branches of critical care medicine. It also, to me, is what defines the essence of paramedicine as its own profession and makes paramedics so much different from other healthcare workers. By which I mean anatomy, physiology, pharmacology, pathology are the same whether you're a doctor, nurse, paramedic. But what makes paramedics different and special is that not only can their environment kill them, but it's forever changing and often unpredictable and often is moving. And that's not something we really have to deal with within hospitals. When studies have been done, 
comparing expert paramedics with novice paramedics, the biggest difference between the two were not the clinical differences, but the non-clinical differences, particularly the scene management or space control management. How paramedics assess and control and maintain their workspace or their resuscitative real estate. How they manage the other resources on scene in terms of the people there and how they manage to establish and maintain a mission trajectory. The thing is that doesn't seem to be taught. Of course, everyone's taught scene safety, but there are other components to management of the environment. So what are those other components? They're listed here. After safety threats have been eliminated or controlled, we need to control space, light, heat, noise, and crowds. Space control is important. So we think about obtaining 360 degrees of access around the patient, particularly the more sick the patient and the more interventions that require to be done. Here's an example of a simulation done overseas for pre-hospital physicians. And an intubation is being done of an infant in the back of an ambulance with the mother of the infant uh, pretty much crowding out where the doctor should be placed to perform the laryngoscopy. I would suggest this is not optimal space control, particularly if there's a difficult airway. On the same course, here's another pre-hospital scene in a patient's bedroom, and we can see that this child who needs to be intubated really will need to be moved away from the head of the bed in order to get that 360 degrees of access, otherwise it will be too crowded to effectively manage that airway. So how do we get 360 degrees of access? Well, the patient either has things around them, or is um, covered by things, or is too close to other things, but we need to clear that space around the patient. We can do that by moving the things from the patient, or moving the patient from the things, but always being mindful about where we're going to move that patient and what other potential hazards might lie in the way. After space, we might think about light and how we minimize light pollution. We all know that when it's dark, we need external light sources and may, we may require other rescue agencies to provide external light sources. But you can have too much light. If you do direct laryngoscopy, uh, in bright sunlight and you're facing the sun, it will be difficult to see. So you know that you need to either orientate that patient away from the sun or get someone to hold up a barrier. And this can be a problem with certain video laryngoscopes that don't show up too well in bright sunlight too. So we've discussed control of the self, control of the team, control of the environment uh, before control of the patient. And the opportunity to do all of these things, that zero point on the clock, can occur at any point before you meet the patient. So think about how you would optimize your own self-preparedness, team preparedness, and get control of your space, heat, light, noise, and crowd after controlling scene safety. After your primary survey, come together as a team and share your update about what's going on and your priorities about what needs to be done and who's going to do it. The zero point survey as a package is not based on randomized control evidence, and you're unlikely to see that in the foreseeable future. But it's been created as a result of years of experience by a number of pre-hospital providers from their work in both the field, in hospital, in inter-hospital situations, and in an aggressive, proactive simulation program that tests these principles. So I would urge people who aren't currently doing this in or out of hospital to please consider using these components of a zero point survey and look out for more presentations on the individual components in which we'll have an opportunity to go into uh, more detail with less time constraint. Thank you very much for listening. Feel free to contact me if you have any questions or comments.